<laughs> Excuse the clickbait title, but this is an account of a walk from Wally Range in Manchester to the city of York from 22nd to 23rd of July 2024. The longest so far of many very long walks I've done over the past decade. Now, I'm 54, 55 in three months, which still feels unlikely and stupidly old. I mean, I don't feel old. I just never thought about being this age. But then why bring it up at all? Am I suggesting the various challenge walks I've done over 10 years are some form of midlife crisis? No. For one, I have always done long walks up to six hours or more. That has increased in recent years. In 2021, I did a 20 hour walk to Derby. The next year, over 17 hours to settle in North Yorkshire. But there was a spur for all this. My mother's terminal cancer diagnosis around 2013 prompted me to do something punishing, almost like a penance, though for what? Who knows? But that was the start. After months of plotting out a route, increasing the lengths of walks I took, I completed a 78 and a bit kilometre that's 49 mile walk around the outside of the M60, Manchester's orbital motorway. That took around 16 and three quarter hours. And from there, I was off. Now, I have to say, I'm very glad I ditched my original plan for this first significant challenge. When I first conceived it, the idea was to do it barefoot. This would have been impossible for me dangerous, and would have proved nothing. The walks I've mentioned, those three initial challenges and a lot of others, long but not quite as long, to various cities and towns around the Northwest, have become part of my life. An ongoing project with, ironically, no destination. So, back to the original question, why bring up my age? Well, first, it was just something I thought I should mention, and second, I guess it's a brag. Hey, look what I can do. But let's get into the walk. As I said before, I was walking from Manchester to York. This would be a little over 111 kilometres, just under 70 miles, and was set to last somewhere between 23 and 24 hours. And my intention was to complete it without stopping. I couldn't afford to stay over in York. And I didn't have anyone to pick me up, so I'd need to get the train back. That meant I had to start and finish in daytime. I needed to be in York before the train stopped running and leave myself a decent buffer of time to allow for delays, obstructions and diversions along the way and the possibility of wandering off course. Taking into account ticket prices on the day I'd set for arrival in York and their times, bearing in mind I'd have been awake over 24 hours by the time I got there, and that I'd still have to travel back to Manchester, walk home from the station, then have dinner and a bath before I could get to bed, the train I picked was just after quarter to three. That being the case, I decided to set off at 10am on Monday. Monday was also a conscious choice. I would be walking through the night somewhere around Leeds and it would likely be quieter on road on a Monday night than Friday or Saturday nights. I could have chosen other weekdays or even set off on Sunday, but I liked Monday. I got up at eight, had breakfast, used the toilet, very important, checked I had everything I needed and at 10, set off. The first hour was easy. It always is. I barely feel I've begun working, walking until after the third hour. I was underway. Wally Range through Trafford, Hume to First Street, on and off the Rochdale Canal to Minchell Street and Ducey Street, then onto the Ashton Canal. I drank some water and had the first bite to eat. I'd packed four meals of six items each. Cheese sandwich, chocolate bar, crisps, jelly babies, apple, banana. One thing for each hour for the projected 24 hours. Food wasn't going to be a problem. Water was the tougher challenge. Water weighs a lot. 
I was carrying four and a half litres, which meant I would need to buy more later. I talked earlier about the long walks I've done. What I didn't mention is how I settled on this walk in particular. I don't know York very well or at all, really. I went once with work for a short visit to the office there and I had the impression I may have been as a child, so I don't really remember. On reflection, that was probably to the Transport Museum. And as long as I can recall, my parents had a print of a drawing of one of the old city gates with the minster behind, which I inherited. I think the drawing is looking from Gillygate, with the minster made closer and more prominent than it actually would be. So there was that fairly floppy connection. There was the fact that due to cost of living pressures, I hadn't undertaken many long walks in one direction where I needed the train back for a while, apart from those single exceptions in 2021 and 22. And I wanted, needed a new challenge. Some weeks earlier, a friend had friend had said something I took to mean they'd like to see another super long walk, which also probably set a seed. Then one day I was idly scanning maps online and thought York might be possible. I had looked at it a couple of years previously and rejected it, but this time when I pulled up the walking directions and saw the predicted time of 24 hours, I didn't see something out of reach. I saw a manageable challenge. I had my next major walk. So getting back to my progress along the route, I was approaching Ashton on the line around two hours and 40 minutes in when the sun broke through and I had to apply sunscreen. By the time I'd done that, the sun was behind clouds again and it once more looked like rain might come at any time. And this was going to be the rest of the day. The canal thus far, and I knew to beyond Staley Bridge, was much quieter and nicer than taking roads, though still fairly grotty in places, often bounded by light industry, derelict spaces, land under development, or apartment blocks that seemed disconnected from their setting. There were fewer runners, dog walkers, and kids fishing than I'd expected. There were masses of colourful flowers, weeds perhaps, if you see them that way, in yellow, white, pink, and purple. There were dragonflies, geese, mallard, iridescent beetles. Clouds alternately hid and pulled aside to reveal the sun. Occasionally, fish broke the surface of the water. Inconsistently, after Ashton, when the towpath was facing the right direction and the view unobstructed, I could see hills rising behind Staley Bridge, some of which I would be amongst, if not soon, at least still very early in the walk. Indeed, Past Staley Bridge, the houses withdrew. Trees, bushes, flowers and grasses overhung the towpath, and hills rose up ahead and to either side. At four hours in, I was still in familiar territory, though usually I'd be walking the other way, coming back from Marsden or Marsden Moor. Lock gates marked the climb into cooler, breezier, but still warm air. Sunset was still over seven hours away, Somewhere out around the outskirts of Leeds, I calculated. Scout Tunnel brought 188 metres of what I anticipated being the darkest part of the walk. The nighttime hours being likely to be lit by street lights. Though clouds and trees conspired to make early afternoon feel closer to early evening. Green tunnels under grey skies. When you're used to long walks... Time shrinks. Hours can almost flash by. And while it takes far longer to get from place to place than travelling by car or train, counterintuitively walking also shrinks distances. Huge parts of Cheshire, West and South Yorkshire, Lancashire, Derby, as well as the whole of Greater Manchester are accessible on foot. I've walked to Staffordshire in a day and North Wales, And I'm well aware I'm quite privileged in this. It isn't possible for everyone. Walking 12, 14, 16 or more hours requires the physical capability and on top of that fitness, time, the capacity to plan and I guess a certain dedication. 
buy up a mill with the first five items from my packed lunch eaten and my first half litre of water drunk. My backpack was still heavy, but fractionally lighter. Taking stock of my body, there were no pains or niggles, and I didn't yet feel tired or slow, but I wouldn't expect to so early in the walk. I hadn't reached six hours, and that is a pretty standard walk for me. As part of documenting the journey, along with writing notes for this account while still preserving phone battery, I took a photo every two hours, or sometimes more, simply because I have Be Real on my phone. That's a, a social media app that prompts you to take a photo of wherever you are at that moment at a different random time each day. The alert today had come around 10 minutes after I set off. A recent update allows users a further five photos in the day if they post their first within two minutes of the alert. I took my second B-reel along with my first planned photo at midday in Droylston. After that, while I took my regular photos every two hours as planned, I switched my B-reels to every three hours. So at 3 p.m., that was at Greenfield, just before Upper Mill. The next would be 6 p.m., 9 p.m. and finally midnight. I was careful, certainly at this stage, to preserve my phone's batteries. I did have two fully charged power banks with me that I could use to recharge, and I had packed a printed copy of my train ticket in case I was out of juice by that time tomorrow. But I might have needed to make an emergency call along the way, so I wanted to ensure I still had sufficient power by the end of the walk. But up a mill. Upper Mill meant Diggle and Standage Tunnel, where I'd have to leave the canal to go over the moors to Marsden, were getting closer, as was the end of the walk's first quarter, the projected first quarter. Although the weather forecast had given only a low percentage chance of rain, I was surprised there hadn't been any yet. Still at Upper Mill, a tall stone railway viaduct over the canal brought a train passing overhead. Not long after that, the canal climbed several locks and the landscape opened out, hills invitingly ahead. The sky continued to be marbled with cloud, but out from under trees, the day was the brightest it had been for a couple of hours. The Diggle end of the Standage Tunnel was where I left the canal and joined the Pennine Bridleway over the moors to Marsden, after which I would be on unfamiliar ground. For now, though, a beautiful climb between fields of sheep, larks and other birds singing, sun glimpsed in darting patches on the ground, stones underfoot. This, again, I normally walk in reverse – starting the descent from Marsden Moor as I head for home. But this time I was heading uphill, and only just into the second quarter of a walk. On the moor, definite rain clouds to my left and potential rain clouds overhead and to my right were broken up and chased off by a large patch of sun. Rain did fall, but less than half a dozen drops struck me. Carelessly, I didn't strike out far enough onto the moor to find a route that would take me down into Marsden. Instead, after crossing the road, I took a path that wandered out onto the moor, then curved back to put me back on the road. The road which drops and bends into Marsden. And around now, an insect, the size, shape and colour of a large grass seed, landed on my notebook, slowly climbed my words, then flew off. Sheep frequently wander onto this road for the grass verges. There are signs warning drives of this hazard, but the speed limit remains 50 miles an hour, and many drivers exceed even this. Consequently, when walking on the road, I'm careful not to startle sheep into traffic. Thankfully, on this occasion, I only had to cross the road once to avoid a mother and her, by now, quite large lamb. A little further on, I took a steep footpath downhill away from the road, hoping I wouldn't be stopped at the bottom. There was once a bridge over a stream there, but no longer. That bridge had taken you onto the bottom end of a path from the moor heading into Marsden. The last time I was here, earlier in the year, the stream was too high to cross, 
But now I was happy to see the water was at a narrow trickle and most of the stream bed was dry and exposed, unbroken stone. The footpath from here is very pleasant, narrow, winding close to the stream, surrounded with trees and flowers. And while the main road can be heard, it's mostly out of sight. Although it's a very different landscape from the village where I grew up from age nine, there's no limestone here, it did feel similar. At the eastern end of the Standage Tunnel, I rejoined the canal for a short distance. In that short distance, I was passed by a train going in each direction, and myself passed a lurking heron across the water without disturbing it. At Marsden Station, I left the canal, and from here it was terra incognita for me. I was still on a route I'd planned for myself. My basic route used directions from Google Maps, but that was mostly along roads, and went in a straighter line north of where I was. So, to remove some of the monotony, I'd chosen to add an extra hour or so to the journey, plotting where I'd come so far, and then an uncertain network of paths and lanes I'd never seen before, finally joining the printed directions an hour or so north and east of Marsden. Now here, I did something you should never do, which is rely on vibes as much as my maps. It was relatively safe. I was never far from where people live. There were plenty of lanes and footpaths to take. There were prominent landmarks to aid navigation. I had a lot of time and daylight to play with, and it wasn't too hard to find myself on my OS map on the few occasions I bothered to check. Even so, even though I didn't deviate far from my planned route, the weather held fair and I did make my way safely. This was extremely foolish on my part. Past fields of cows sat gently chewing and fields of small ponies stood doing the same. A soft drizzle came on. Dogs barked in the farms and houses I passed. Even though I was now certain I was on the right route, I kept my maps in hand until I knew I was on the road where I joined the route Google had plotted and could swap them for my printed directions. It was half past seven, raining and gloomy. I put on my jacket and reflective vest, hung reflective bands off my backpack and continued. Approaching out lane, the rain stopped, but I kept the reflective bands and vest. I knew I might as well retain them as they were until after sunrise on Tuesday. It wasn't going to get much lighter now before sunset at 20 past nine. I was, for the time being, on roads I had actually walked before, probably when I walked to Leeds and possibly also when I foolishly and unnecessarily walked to Huddersfield by road rather than canal. It was the least pleasant part of the walk so far. Part of that may have been that it was sweltering in my jacket. So as soon as it was no longer raining, I took it off. And while I was cooler, there was no magical transformation of the grey, car-infested surroundings. This part of the walk remained unpleasant, and I was relatively sure much of the coming night would be similarly benighted. Worse, as sometimes happens, many of the distances quoted in the printed directions were arrant nonsense. I might have begun to doubt myself if the roads weren't familiar and I hadn't seen the map to know this was the route. Even so, I did check what the route looked like from where I was on Google using my phone. It looked exactly as expected and the roads remained familiar. Ghastly, but familiar. During this time, at 9pm, I was buoyed to know I'd completed 11 hours. Not yet halfway, but near enough. It was definitely evening now, even though joining the roads and the brief burst of rain seemed just five minutes ago and not the 90 it actually was. Further down the road, Rastrick was quiet save the odd car. Shops were shut, lights on in houses, some curtains closed. As it was still warm, some bedroom windows stood open. The streets were deserted. Hearteningly, the directions began to conform to reality. 
I was happier again. Brickhouse was busier. Takeaways open, people on the street, more lights and activity, more cars. Despite knowing better, it felt like I was almost in Leeds. I suppose in relative terms, given the length of the walk, I was almost there, but not really. After ten, with the light gone but the sky still pale blue between clouds, I was out of built-up areas again. There was a footway and the cars were infrequent. The silence was less strange than it had seemed in Rastrick. And now I was over halfway. Somewhere ahead lay Leeds and beyond the rest of the short night. And by sunrise, I'd be past three quarters of the way to York. Just to interject here, the difficulty of writing when it's dark, I think tiredness and later through Leeds frustration with making sense of the directions and the map meant I wrote less than I might have wanted to. Even then, much of what I did write focused on the mundane and obvious and whatever was irritating me in the moment. Anyway, back to the walk and my contemporaneous, though edited and expanded account. Further on, back among houses, around Hartshead Moortop, Scholes area, expecting a road turning, I overshot. Heading back, I was led to a footpath which took me by light of my head torch held in my hand under a motorway, the M62, through a field and back to roads, all of which misses a lot of detail. The infrequent steps down in the early part of the footpath, which nearly caused me to stumble a couple of times. The bats flickering over the path, trying to find a route through the field of wheat without stepping on the crops. The worry that someone might appear and start yelling at me. But that never happened. Around 25 past 11, somewhere close to Drub Village, I think, I saw the moon for the first time that night, large and full and orange. The road at night between towns was quiet and featureless. Although the night was cool, after more than 13 hours walking, I was still sweaty. At Drillington, after midnight, over 14 hours in, I was finally pleasantly cooled down. Leads not too far ahead, and less than five hours of the night left. My body still, self, still felt fine. It was harder to write in my notebook, dependent as I was on streetlights, although tall, downward-facing LEDs are much better for the activity than the old-school lights were. Those darker, orange-hued lights spaced in such a way that they caused regular shadows across the page. Later on, for a short time, the lights would be further apart among trees, and shadows would be a problem. Having passed some of the worst sections, or so I thought, I was genuinely enjoying the walk again. I'd reached that stage of walking where it seems almost inconceivable to stop, where I feel like I can walk forever. With less happening, less to see at night, and with no walking companion to talk with, time slows a little. It's still relatively accelerated by the extended duration of the walk, but less so than during daylight. By one in the morning, my feet were beginning to feel the exertion, but not in a way that concerned me. I was as confident of completing the walk as when I started. Leeds, as expected, was a nightmare of unhelpful directions, lack of street names or obvious landmarks on the route, uh, which largely avoided the city centre, and location detection on Google Maps on my phone that kept jumping around from incorrect place to incorrect place. I had to keep carefully triangulating map and directions and names of buildings and businesses that appeared on the map, and I still managed to wander off course a couple of times. Later, I found myself on a road that had just stopped. I turned back, checked my directions and map, crossed the road, then turned and tried again. There was a van that I'd noticed earlier parked on this side of the road with its headlights on, but hadn't paid much attention. This time, passing it again, I saw it was a police van with at least one officer sat inside. 
I got further up the road and realized the directions were taking me through a small park. I decided not to walk through it, so turned back again to follow some roads that I could see bypassed it and rejoined my route. And despite all this suspicious activity, the police didn't challenge me, didn't say a word. 90 minutes before sunrise, with the sky already paling, I found myself among what looked like new developments, and I hoped indicated I was reaching the far side of Leeds, which had been by far the worst part of the walk. Shortly afterwards, I was out of Leeds, on York Road A64, the day brightening, the dawn chorus underway. I'd plugged my phone into one of the power banks and had both in one hand to remedy the battery depredations of navigating Leeds. I was surrounded by fields behind dense verges beginning to regain colour after the night. The end of the night was, if not in sight, appreciably closer. I even had half a suspicion I might reach York in less time than expected. A horse snorted behind the hedgerow. Arable fields not quite ready for harvest. The sky promised a light that wasn't here yet. Signs told me York was ahead, though no distances were given. I was still hot, my feet complaining a little. Something I hadn't planned for was the footway running out, just in time for the early commuters racing to work. For the most part, there were sufficient verges, damp and depositing grass seeds on my boots. But once again, I cursed this country's inadequate public transport, lack of provision for pedestrians and cyclists, and cultural over-reliance on cars, not even to mention how much freight travels by road. Further along the A64, the sun was bright, the sky clearer than yesterday, the footway had returned and the walking was easy. It promised to be a lovely day and less punishing than Monday, or the second half of Monday's walk at any rate. But it was clear now that I'd reach York at 11 or later, more like 25 hours than the 23 or less I'd hoped for. Tadcaster was smaller and more attractive than I'd expected. It was also where, perhaps growing tired, I decided to navigate by vibes again. Chucking out Google Maps and my printed directions to follow road signs. This was a mistake and took me well out of my way. The correct route, once I made my way back to it, was prettier, calmer, easier, more rural, reminiscent of various other places I've walked or lived and walked. North Yorkshire, South Wales, Oxfordshire, Hampshire, Greater Manchester. Prettier, calmer, easier, more rural, until, that is, rejoining the A64. Wide, grey, busy, noises, and with a wildlife death toll. I hadn't previously mentioned the carnage, though it was evident almost from the beginning outside Leeds. Dozens of dead animals, foxes, hedgehogs, rabbits, hares, squirrels, doves, hawks and others unidentifiable, all blasted by traffic in differing states of decay or desiccation, all because getting there, wherever there is, five minutes earlier is more important than anything else. Now, relatively inconsequential to either the carnage or the walk as a whole, but this was one of the issues I had in mind when I picked out my t-shirt for the walk. It has the slogan, train good, uh, train good, car bad. It's merchandise from the leftist engineering disasters podcast, well there's your problem. It felt appropriate since I was walking to York, catching the train back, and despise our car culture. Even so, I hadn't appreciated just how abominable both Leeds and eventually the A64 would be. Still not as bad as my real bugbear, Cheshire, but atrocious nonetheless. But things did improve. Along the way, I met and spoke to a man on a much shorter walk in the same direction. A much more sensible walk. We parted at the point my route left the dual carriageway for a footpath through fields. Though 
before we got there, he did have the encouraging news that York was only four miles away. Through the fields, butterflies and moths flickered unsteadily in front, alongside, behind. Grass reached up to my head, small patches of poppies added colour. I was grateful to have such an oasis of beauty so close to the end. The wheat here was riper than that close to Leeds. In the distance, a combine harvest has started its work. Once again, I got a little off track leaving the footpath I needed to follow, rejoining the A64 too soon, and having to figure where I was on the map and where I would leave it again to head north into York. But I was very close to the city now, and despite a few deviations from my route, still had an abundance of time. Back on the A64, the pain in my feet, which it had been evident were blistered for more than an hour, came back. The psychological impacts of being in an obnoxious environment are very powerful. In the fields, the pain was easier to ignore or minimise. I reached York, or at least the Welcome to York sign, shortly before quarter past eleven, a walk of just over 25 hours. I walked into the city. Found the station, then walked back to a bench at the entrance of York Racecourse to sit down for an hour before heading back to the station. Bees dashed from flower to flower, landing on dandelions that bowed from the weight, then sprang back afterwards. The sun intermittently appeared from behind clouds for increasing periods of time. It was nice to sit for a while, even as it became evident how tired I was. It shouldn't have surprised me, but it did. On the walk, from sunrise to the approach to York, the day felt cooler than Monday. But sitting in the sun, the day felt very warm. The achievement of walking for such a long time hadn't quite sunk in. Partly because I knew I still had to walk back to the station, take the train back to Manchester, Victoria, and then walk home. And I had to walk home to stop off and buy some food, because once home, I needed to eat dinner. I also badly needed a bath. And these were the thoughts cycling in my head while I sat there, enjoying the sun and not being on my feet with a heavy backpack bruising my shoulders. So, reflecting on the whole adventure, now I've been back for a couple of days, There's a simplicity, a a purity, a clarity of purpose and execution to these challenge walks. Afterwards, even with blistered feet, I felt good, physically and mentally lighter. I was elated. It's an accomplishment that not many people can achieve. I'm proud that I did it and wondering what the next challenge might be.